Hello everybody and welcome back or welcome to my channel and to another true crime video. Thank you so much for being here. If you are new to my channel you may be wondering why I am speaking in a soft spoken voice and that's because this is an ASMR channel but I know there are lots of people who enjoy true crime content but perhaps don't enjoy the whispers that come with ASMR so much. So I'm hoping that we can sort of meet in the middle and it'll be a win-win for everyone. That being said, if you are not a fan of true crime content, please just click out of this video. I do make non-true crime ASMR content as well and there are plenty of other amazing creators to check out. If you like this type of video, make sure to like this video and comment down below what cases you would like to see me do in future. And please subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be eternally grateful to you. But other than that, I think we will just get straight into the case. So today we will be talking about the murder of Michelle Martinko, who was an 18 year old girl who was brutally murdered and her case was unsolved for 39 years until they finally caught the killer through DNA evidence. And I personally find these cases really fascinating and kind of satisfying to hear about how these very, very cold cases are being solved through new technology. Um, so I really did a deep dive on this one and uh, it ended up being pretty long, my script that is. So I have a feeling it will be broken up into two parts, but don't worry, the next part will be out within a few days. And as usual, this will be a voiceover video, but there will be plenty of pictures throughout. And luckily when it comes to this case, there was, there was a lot of images, both of Michelle and know of evidence and the suspect so it's definitely worth the watch and other than that let's just get into it michelle marie martenko was born on october 6 1961 in cedar rapids iowa cedar rapids was a small town where she lived with her parents albert and Je and janet martenko and her older sister janelle Janelle was actually 12 years older than Michelle, and before Michelle was born, Janet, her mother, who was 44 at the time, had suffered five previous miscarriages. Janelle said of Michelle's birth, quote, It was great. I mean, it was just so exciting when my sister was born, and she was the miracle baby. Michelle was a beautiful girl, the kind of beautiful that people noticed. People would turn their heads when she passed, but Michelle was unaware of her beauty and the effect that it had on people. She had gone through an awkward phase in her early teens due to a brace that she had to wear after being diagnosed with scoliosis, which is curvature of the spine. The brace went from her neck to her hips, and although it was worn under her clothes, it was something that she was very self-conscious about. She always felt that people were looking at her funny and it made her uncomfortable and probably a little bashful, you know, just very self-conscious. Her sister Janelle said about this time in Michelle's life, quote, she felt very different, very self-conscious. She couldn't move around like other kids could move around, so that was a tough period. Michelle's brace came off when she was 14 years old, but I do wonder if some of those feelings of feeling awkward or self-conscious may have lingered um, and prevented Michelle from actually realizing just how beautiful she was because she really was stunning and I'll be putting pictures up um, throughout this video so you get to see for yourself um, but at this point it was the late 70s um, or early to late 70s and Farrah Fawcett was really really big at the time so she was who everyone wanted to look like at this point with her, you know, big, voluminous, cascading, bouncy gold hair. And Michelle was no exception. So she actually started styling her hair in this way as well. And she was always beautifully dressed and she seemed to take pride in that. And she was quite a fashionista, I guess you would say. But as well as her outer beauty, Michelle was a very beautiful, kind person inside too. And this was something that everyone who knew her said about her. 
Her beauty didn't go to her head and she was said to have been a very humble and very sweet girl who was kind to everyone she met. She and her family were members of the Catholic Church and Michelle's faith was very strong. She was a prominent member in campus life, which seems to have been a kind of a youth youth group um, and a non-profit organization where teenagers can meet and hang out and kind of talk about their issues and what they're going through and going through high school and just being a teenager in general, you know, in a friendly, non-judgmental judgmental environment. Everyone who spoke of Michelle said that she was incredibly welcoming and she had a great sense of humor. So it's no surprise that she was a part of this group and a very loved member at that. Michelle went to Kennedy High School, where she was said to have been an above average student. In 1979, which is when her murder sadly occurred, Michelle was 18 and a high school senior, and her plans after graduating were to study interior design at Iowa State University. When Michelle was a sophomore in high school, she had joined the Baton Twirling Squad and she also loved performing in the school's theatre productions. And through these groups she made a lot of friends and it seems as though Michelle was always, you know, willing to take in everyone as a friend. She was also a part of her school's choir and she was said to have had a beautiful singing voice that stood out from her peers and she wasn't afraid to sing loud and proud and just really seemed to enjoy it. She was also a big lover of poetry, so we can see she's a more creative, kind of cultural person. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background as to what kind of person Michelle was. So, on the night of her murder, December 19th, 1979, Michelle had actually attended her school's end-of-year choir banquet. So this was a celebration that was held annually for the school choir, obviously, and that year it took place at the Sheraton Inn. The banquet was said was scheduled to end at 7pm, but everyone who went said it was kind of boring, so a lot of people were leaving early, and Michelle was one of these people. She, did, she had decided to leave early, telling one of her friends, her best friend in fact, Jane Hansen, that she wanted to swing by the mall to pick up a new winter coat and she asked Jane if she'd like to come with her. Jane had declined since she'd missed a few days of school due to being sick and she had quite a bit of homework to catch up on. So Michelle left on her own in her 1977 green and tan Buick Electra. This car was kind of just the family vehicle and they all just drove it when they needed to so Michelle had been given the car to use that night. Specifically, Michelle left in the car to go to Westdale Mall, which was a brand new mall that had just opened two months earlier in October. Cedar Rapids did have one other mall on the east side of town, which Michelle actually worked at at a clothing store. But Westdale Mall was on the west side of town, closer to home, and because Westdale Mall was so new, at that time it was like the place to be. And when Michelle arrived that evening, the parking lot was super busy, partly because it was new and everyone was going there, and also partly because uh, this was just before Christmas, so there was a lot of people doing Christmas shopping. So because of this, Michelle actually had to park quite far away from the mall's entrance. Specifically, she parked in front of the J.C. Penny, which was in sort of a, a far-off corner of, of the parking lot. She got out of her car and pulled her trademark rabbit fur coat closer around her. And this rabbit fur coat is something that everyone seemed to mention when talking about Michelle and, you know, what, she, what kind of clothes she wore or what she was wearing that night. Which specifically, she had been wearing a black v-neck dress and a matching scarf um, with dark colored stockings and black open-toed high heel shoes. And then, of course, had her white rabbit fur coat on top. Um, she was pretty dressed up for the choir banquet, but her her coat had been one that she was sort of known for. So when Michelle entered the mall, she started looking for the store in which she was supposed to pick up her new coat. Her mother had picked it out and put it on layby for her, and she'd given Michelle the rest of the money needed to purchase it. Um, this was like an early Christmas present and she had been given the money so that if she decided that she liked it she could buy it and you know it would sort of be an early present. 
So Michelle hadn't actually seen the coat at this point because her mum had picked it and she knew that Michelle was very particular about her clothes, which is why she had told Michelle to go and see it before buying it. But because Michelle hadn't actually gone to the store with her mother and this was a brand new mall, she had a hard time locating the store. The mall had over 100 stores and was two stories, so by around 8.45 p.m. Michelle had gotten a little lost and she decided to ring her mother for directions to the store. Her mother Janet said that when Michelle hang, hung up the phone she had sounded excited, just her normal happy self, and we know that Michelle found the store not long afterwards and she did try on the coat but ultimately decided that it wasn't for her and so she didn't end up buying it and instead just kept the $186 in cash that her mother had given her to buy the coat. While at the mall, Michelle was also doing a little bit of Christmas shopping herself and she ended up running into quite a few people she knew. Because like I said, this was like the place to be, it was where everyone was going, especially young people. So it wasn't out of the ordinary that Michelle would bump into people. One of whom was actually her ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel. So Michelle and Andy had met when she was 15 and he was 16 at a roller skating rink, which is so cute and so 70s, I love it. So Michelle had seen Andy at this roller skating rink and he was struggling to skate. He was falling over and like grasping onto the side and he just wasn't having any luck. So she'd approached him and she sort of started teasing him and laughing and she asked him if he actually needed some help and he agreed so they spent the next few hours skating around together laughing and having fun and she was just trying to help him learn how to skate better and after that they met up at the roller skating rink a few more times um, so that Michelle could keep teaching Andy how to skate and Andy said that they actually started dating when they bonded over their mutual love of pizza, which is too pure for this world, and I just absolutely love it. So Michelle and Andy dated for two years, at which point Michelle decided to break things off because she no longer wanted to be in a committed relationship. And Andy was said to have not taken the breakup well at all. He was still very much in love with Michelle and he was obsessed with the idea of getting back with her. His friend said that he was always talking to them about her and, you know, wondering what she was doing or if she was dating anyone else, you know, what did those guys have that he didn't and how was he going to get her back? But this night that they had seen each other in the mall, uh, it was about a year after their breakup, so everyone around him seemed to know that Andy still loved Michelle and he still wanted to get back with her but at this point they were just friends and they had decided to remain close friends even though they had broken up. At this point because Andy was a year older than Michelle he was still living with his parents in Cedar Rapids but he was attending the nearby university or college however you want to say it. And like I said, they had remained close friends, so obviously the breakup hadn't been detri detrimental to their friendship and neither had Andy's lingering feelings. So earlier that night, uh, Andy had actually phoned Michelle's house because he wanted to give her a Christmas gift, so he wanted to catch up and organize when he could give it to her. But Michelle's mother informed him that Michelle wasn't actually there. And some sources say that Michelle's mother had just told him she was at the choir banquet and others said that she told him that Michelle was at the mall. So I'm not quite sure what was correct, but Andy says that at this point he had already decided to go to the Westdale Mall with his friend Murray Winkler because he was actually going to pick up Michelle's Christmas gift. He hadn't bought it yet, but he had decided what he wanted to get her and that was a fiber optic light from Spencer's Gifts because this was the 70s and at the time these fiber optic lights were the new rage, they were really cool and you know new technology and uh, Andy knew that Michelle wanted one because she'd mentioned it in passing. So that night, December 19th, he went ahead with the plan to pick it up and he ended up running into Michelle while at the mall. So they chatted briefly because, you know, they were still on good terms, um, but he wanted to separate um, because he needed to go pick up this gift. 
so he asked them not to follow him and they kind of joked around he's like ah don't follow me you know I have to go get your present uh, because he didn't want to see the gift obviously but before parting Michelle asked if if she could call him later and he said yes and when they parted Michelle was her usual happy self and everything seemed normal to Andy so as well as Andy Seidel and his friend Murray Winkler Michelle had also run into a few boys from school that night and their names were Todd Bergen, Martin Miller and Tracy Price and I have also heard the name Jeff White thrown around but I'm not entirely sure anyway so they had stopped by the mall to do a little bit of Christmas shopping before planning to go see a movie. So they were essentially just killing time at the mall and they happened to run into Michelle. So they stopped to chat for to her for a bit, you know, just what are you doing here? Like, ah, oh, what are you up to? We're going to the movies. Like, what are you doing? And she told them that she was there to buy a coat that her mother had put on lay-by for her, but that she'd ultimately decided not to. And while she was telling them this, she sort of flashed the wad of cash that she'd still had in her purse, you know, being like, you know, I've still got this money because I didn't end up, end up getting the coat. And Todd Bergen remembered telling her, you know, like, put that cash away, you shouldn't be flashing around, you know, waving money around like that, that's kind of dangerous. But other than that, nothing was out of the ordinary. Michelle seemed, you know, bright and bubbly and happy as she always was. And there was nothing unusual about the encounter that any of the boys could remember. So they parted ways and then the last person that Michelle would see in the mall that night was a boy named Curtis Thomas. So Curtis worked at a men's clothing store in the mall called Chess King and business was kind of slow at this point in the night so he was doing that thing where you stand outside the store, you know, just outside and sort of try to lure people in, you know, yelling things out, whether that be like, come inside, you know, 50% off, whatever it is. So he was doing that. And he said that initially he didn't recognize Michelle, but she started walking towards him and she flashed that beautiful, bright smile of hers. And he said he just remembers that moment so clearly. And he realized that it was Michelle. So Curtis was two years younger than Michelle, he was actually only 16, but they had met at school after Curtis had gotten into a little bit of trouble at school, something small, you know, like being late or something like that, but he had been given the option of either detention or helping out with the school play. So he ultimately decided on helping out with the play, um, so that was his punishment and that's actually how he met Michelle who he said had always been very kind to him and she went out of her way to make him feel welcome because Michelle had known that Curtis had felt a little uncomfortable that this wasn't his usual crowd and he didn't have any friends in the play so she could tell he was a little nervous or just a little uncomfortable so she went out of her way to make him feel welcome and they became friends. On this night on the mall, like I said, Michelle had approached him with a big smile and they chatted for a bit before Curtis told Michelle that he was about to take his break and he asked if she would wait for him. So Michelle agreed and Curtis went back and you know, told his manager, hey, since it's quiet, can I take my last break? And he was allowed to, so he and Michelle went to the food court together. Specifically, they went to a place called Orange Julius, which I'm not familiar with this, but I, I can only guess they got an orange juice. I have no idea. Besides the point though. So they went to the food court and they were there for about a half hour or so, just chatting, catching up, you know, as friends do. Um, and Curtis realized, oh, like, oh shit, I'm, I'm going to be late getting back. So he was like, oh, look, I got to get back to work. Um, I have to help my manager close the store. So Michelle was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, I'm going to get going now too. Um, because she was ready to go home at this point. So Curtis walked her to the mall's exit and they had to walk past Curtis's work, Chess King, on the way to the exit. And Curtis peered into the store as he was passing and realized that it was super busy in there now. It had suddenly gotten busy and his manager was behind the counter with like four people lined up. So he knew like, oh, I got to get back. I got to get back soon. But he walked Michelle to the exit and they said goodbye, you know, he just sort of said, ah, I better go close the store. And she said, yeah, you know, good to catch up, you know, keep in touch. So Curtis went back to his work and when he got there, his manager was like, hey, is, is that your girlfriend? And he was like, no, no, it's, it's not my girlfriend, just a friend. And 
she sort of said, you know, well, maybe she should be your girlfriend. She's pretty cute. And he was kind of, you know, bashful about it. It's, it's possible that Curtis may have had a little bit of a crush on Michelle. He hasn't confirmed this, but it sort of seems that way. So anyway, he busies himself with the customers and closing the store. But he would later say that this night would haunt him for the rest of his life because he just wishes that he could have walked Michelle to her car and kept her safe. And I can't imagine the guilt, even though, you know, it wasn't his fault at all. And it's very normal to feel that guilt after something so terrible happens, especially to a friend and one that you were one of the last people to see. And um, Jane Hansen, who was the friend who Michelle had gone to the choir banquet with, um, Jane also said that she had terrible guilt because she hadn't gone with Michelle that night and she had always wondered whether or not if she'd gone, Michelle would still be alive. But there's no telling if, if that would have been true, obviously, because Jane might have just become a victim herself. But obviously this affected everyone around Michelle terribly and I, I can't imagine how haunting it must have been to all of them. And it was actually Jane who was one of the very first people that Michelle's family contacted after they started growing worried since Michelle had not come home yet. And Jane said that when she got the call she didn't immediately think anything bad had happened to her best friend and she was instead worried that Michelle was going to get in trouble for missing curfew or being out with a boy or something along those lines. You know, she had no idea of what had actually happened. Um, but she told Janet, uh, Michelle's mum, what she knew of Michelle's whereabouts and that, you know, she hadn't seen her since she left the choir banquet. But this obviously didn't calm Michelle's parents' worries. So they rang around several other of Michelle's friends, um, including Andy Seidel, so he was rung around midnight and he told them that he hadn't heard from Michelle since seeing her at the mall, but he did offer to drive around looking for her. And her parents said, you know, yes, please do. We, we're really worried about her. But Andy had an idea that Michelle might be at this place called Gatsby's, which was where a lot of young people kind of frequented. I'm not exactly sure what it was. I've seen it described as a club, but obviously at age 18, it, it's not like a nightclub, so maybe it was different in the 70s, who knows? So anyway, he decided to go to Gatsby's, and he was getting up to leave when his mother woke up, and she said, you know, um, where are you going? And he explained the situation, so she actually offered to come with him, because she was worried about him, and she wanted to be another set of eyes, hoping to find Michelle. But they didn't have any luck finding her um, at Gatsby's. They were looking out for a car, looking out for her, and they they couldn't find her. And they also couldn't find her down the main street. Um, they drove around for a bit, just looking for a car. But in the end, they ended up going back home. And Andy slept for a few hours until the morning. So Michelle's mother, Janet, said that she knew that Michelle should have been home by 10 p.m. at the latest. And, you know, she'd just been going to pick up this coat, do a little bit of Christmas shopping, and she didn't have any other plans after that, as far as Janet knew. So when 11pm rolled around and Janet still hadn't heard from Michelle, there was no sign of her, she immediately knew that something was very wrong. The mall would have closed by that time, and there was no indication of Michelle's whereabouts, and like I said, she spent the night ringing around Michelle's friends, but didn't have any luck, so they ended up reporting Michelle as missing to the police at around 2am. And by 4am, just two hours later, Michelle's body would be found. Michelle's body had been found in her car which was still parked in the northwest parking lot of the Westdale Mall, behind the J.C. Penney store. Her parents had told the police that the mall was her last known whereabouts, so police officer James Kincaid had gone down there and was the first on the scene. And at this point, the car park was completely empty, and it wasn't hard to spot Michelle's 1977 tan and green Buick Electra. It was parked quite far away from the mall entrance because, as I mentioned earlier, the mall was super busy that night, but James Kincaid went over to it right away, and he said that he could see a figure slumped inside the front passenger seat. He said about this first moment, saying, quote, 
It appeared like it was an older woman, and my first thought was somebody's intoxicated and passed out in their car. End quote. But he soon realized that the situation was far more dire when he took a closer look. Quote, I walked around the car to the passenger side front door, and I looked in and saw Michelle there, covered in blood. Now at this point, the police knew that this had become a homicide investigation, but crimes like this were almost unheard of in Cedar Rapids. Even though Cedar Rapids wasn't a super small town, it still very much had that small town feel, and this was a crime that would completely change that. Every single police officer in Cedar Rapids was called to work on the crime scene that night and they all said that it was the worst they had ever seen. The lead detective of Michelle's case was Detective Harvey Denlinger and he was at the crime, crime scene that night and said, quote, I had never seen anybody stab that many times. Something like that was unheard of around here. It was clear that Michelle had been stabbed and slashed at, and due to the nature of the wounds, there was a huge amount of blood in the car. It was actually later discovered that she had lost one third of the blood in her body. I am going to be getting into the details of the state of Michelle's body and her wounds, so if that's something you're not comfortable with, just skip ahead about 30 seconds. So Michelle had 29 wounds, 11 of which were stab wounds, mainly to her chest area, and two of which had penetrated her lungs and sliced her aorta, which ultimately is what caused her death. The rest of the wounds were cut wounds or slash wounds, and she also had some slicing wounds on her chin and face and between her fingers, which the medical examiner would later describe as textbook defensive wounds, so this suggested that Michelle had really put up a fight and she had fiercely fought off her attacker for as long as she could. Michelle's shopping bags were also still on the back seat of the car, and underneath Michelle's body was her purse, which still had the $186 that she had been given by her mother, so this immediately led the police to believe that the murder had not been motivated by a robbery. Michelle was also still fully dressed. Um, her dress had been pulled up, but she still had her stockings on, and she had not been sexually assaulted. No murder weapon was retrieved at the scene, and although the obvious assumption would be that, you know, she'd been attacked with a knife, the medical examiner said that he couldn't actually conclusively tell what the weapon was, and instead described the weapon as a sharp, pointed object which is very interesting because I think it's, I wonder what they were thinking when, when they said that. I wonder what they have to have in terms of evidence to prove that it was a knife. But I suppose it could have been, you know, a shard of glass, a screwdriver even. But I, I personally would presume it was a knife. But anyway, that's just me. So there were also no foreign fingerprints found inside the car, which just means that there were no fingerprints other than Michelle's or her family's or anyone's, you know, who would be expected to be in the car. However, police did find rubber glove impressions on the outside of the car and on one of the door handles in dirt and inside of the car in blood. The forensic technician who photographed the crime scene that night, Richard White, said that he kind of recognized the pattern of the gloves, so he actually went out and bought himself a pair of rubber, rubber dishwashing gloves and discovered that they matched the pattern of impressions that were found at the crime scene. Richard White was also responsible for taking a blood sample from the gear shift of the car. He scraped it off with a razor blade and then very carefully lifted the blood with fingerprinting tape before sealing it in an evidence bag. And this was great thinking and showed a lot of forethought on Richard White's part because at this point, you know, this was the 70s, DNA evidence really wasn't a thing at the time, but he just had a feeling that he should do this. Um, a lot of the police officers believe that in such a brutal attack, it was very likely that the killer himself probably had wounded himself. You know, it's very common 
in these kinds of crimes, particularly on the hand if the, for example, blade of the knife slips into their palm. So they had an idea that the killer's blood could be present, but of course DNA evidence wasn't a thing. So the fact that Richard White had the forethought to take this blood evidence was amazing, and he was specifically fixated on the blood on the gear shift, and this would actually be essential to later solving the case. Now the police's theory at this point of what had happened to Michelle was that she had exited the mall and someone who had possibly been following her or waiting for her in the parking lot attacked her as she got into her car. Michelle was actually seen leaving the mall by a girl named Cheryl Landers and Cheryl Landers knew Michelle from school. Cheryl herself was only 15 years old so it wasn't like she and Michelle were friends but she recognized Michelle from her big blonde hair and her trademark rabbit fur coat. So she was smoking a cigarette just outside the mall before she was intending to enter and she said that she saw Michelle walk out into the parking lot and that she came out at the same time as several other people. You know, the mall was starting to close, so a lot of people were sort of petering out of the mall, but Cheryl didn't actually see Michelle with anyone specifically, nor did she see anybody following after her. Cheryl soon entered the mall, and she did not witness the attack of Michelle, but clearly at this point there are still people around, so the fact that the attack took place in such a public area so brazenly is pretty insane. After this, no one else reported seeing Michelle, but a mall employee named Phoebe Porter said that she saw Michelle's car at around 11pm, which she remembered thinking was strange due to the mall having closed already. The investigators believe that after Cheryl had seen Michelle leave the mall, Michelle had walked to her car in the dark parking lot, opened the back door of the car, put her shopping bags inside, then got into the driver's seat and put the key in the ignition, perhaps just starting the car to warm it up for a moment and get the frost off the windows because, you know, this was December, it was a chilly night, so she may have sat there for just a moment, but before she could actually drive away, her attacker opened the car door forced himself inside and immediately started attacking Michelle with a sharp object. The scene of the crime and Michelle's body suggested that it was a blitz attack, meaning that it was sudden and frenzied, and they could also tell that the perpetrator used a huge amount of force in a burst of violence against Michelle. Blitz attacks suggest a disorganized killer, someone who wasn't concerned about covering up their crime necessarily, but we do know that Michelle's killer must have put some planning into her murder because they were wearing those rubber gloves when it happened. So because of this very brutal, seemingly personal, frenzied attack, as well as that the murder didn't seem to be motivated by robbery or sexual assault, it seemed as though it was a crime of passion most likely by someone who knew Michelle and may have had it out for her. So working off of this theory, the most obvious lead to police was of course Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel. Their suspicions of him were also backed up by Michelle's family, who had immediate concerns about Andy after hearing of Michelle's death. It was well known that Andy had not taken the breakup well, almost becoming obsessed with Michelle, and not only that, but he had called the house that night and possibly been told of Michelle's whereabouts. Michelle's family and the police both thought that it could have been a case of, if I can't have her, no one can, which I'm sure if you are a fan of true crime content, then you have certainly seen this kind of motive before. Andy's behaviour at Michelle's funeral did not help suspicions either, so at this point he was being closely watched by police and just by people in the community and particularly Michelle's family as well, so his actions were definitely under the microscope, but they didn't really have to be for people to notice that his behaviour was odd. He actually went up to Michelle's casket, which was an open casket, and he was said to have almost climbed inside with her. He 
just wrapped his arms around her and slumped over her body, bawling his eyes out. And he looked up at one of his friends and while sobbing said, quote, I have to know who she loved when she died, end quote. So this certainly raised some eyebrows and just further pointed in the direction of the if I can't have her, no one can motive. Police would end up questioning any boy who Michelle had dated, but Andy was the only strong suspect. The same day as the funeral, he was questioned by detectives and they asked Andy if he had gone to the Westdale Mall the night of Michelle's murder because he knew that she would be there. Andy denied this because he said he already had plans to go to the mall and as we know he went with his friend Murray Winkler and he also lived with Murray who told detectives that he dropped Andy off after they'd gone to the mall and Andy's mother backed this up as well as claiming that Andy had stayed home for the rest of the night aside from when they had both gone out to look for Michelle. So this of course gave Andy an alibi but it didn't entirely satisfy the police, nor did it satisfy Michelle's family and friends. Everyone knew that parents would often lie to protect their children, or perhaps even if Andy's mother hadn't lied, Andy could have snuck out after his mother had gone to bed and then gone back to the mall to kill Michelle. However, there was no physical evidence of this theory, nor was there really any physical evidence that pointed in Andy's direction at all. So, although everyone was still highly suspicious of him, the police just had to move on to other leads. But, this didn't stop the people of Cedar Rapids, as well as the media, to speculate about Andy's guilt, even going so far as to publicly accuse and harass him. After Michelle's murder, nobody was able to talk about anything else. It was such a horrifying and incomprehensible crime especially in Cedar Rapids, which, although it wasn't a super small town, up to this point it very much had that small town, close-knit feel to it, so Michelle's murder was all anyone could think of. The police even warned young women in the community not to shop alone, and this warning only held more weight when the week after Michelle's death, two women were assaulted by armed men wearing ski masks. Not only that, but two women had also reported to police that they had been followed when driving home from work. And even though both of these cases didn't end up linking to Michelle's murder, everyone was on high alert and extremely paranoid, and this fear also bred anger, which was often directed at Andy Seidel. Andy himself had claimed that Michelle had told him previously that she'd felt as though she was being watched by a man while she was at work, and he believed this could have been Michelle's killer, but this didn't really hold a lot of weight to anybody else. And because the police had no hard evidence against him, Andy Seidel actually left Cedar Rapids not long after Michelle's death to join the Navy and I'm guessing just to get away from all the pressure and the pain of Michelle's murder. On January 25th, 1980, just over a month after Michelle's murder, the police chief, James Barnes, held a press conference in which he told the public that two eyewitnesses had come forward, claiming that they may have seen Michelle's attacker on the night of December 19th. With the help of these two witnesses, police had been able to come up with a sketch of what the perpetrator may have looked like. The sketch showed a white man in his late teens to early 20s, between 5'8 and 6 foot, and around 65 kgs to 70 kgs in weight, or 165 to 175 pounds. He had brown eyes and curly brown hair. The two witnesses were both middle-aged women, and they had no connection to each other, but they actually both had to be put under hypnosis several times before they were able to give a description of who they thought they had seen in order for a sketch to be created. Despite this, police used the sketch to go through Kennedy High School's yearbook. In April of 1980, 
A bottle was found in a river just outside of Cedar Rapids, and inside there was a note claiming that the author was being held captive by the killer of Michelle Martenko, and this note directed police officers to a cabin in Paris, Iowa. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a hoax and was just many one of many cruel pranks that people would play, which included ringing up Michelle's family and pretending to be a distraught Michelle, which is so disgusting. People can be so despicable, it's just incomprehensible how you could be so cruel. And this, of course, was extremely hard on Michelle's family, who were already obviously absolutely devastated by Michelle's brutal murder. Janelle, who was already moved out of home and married by the time of Michelle's murder, said, quote, We just hugged and we couldn't believe she was gone. My dad was very stoic about it, but he was angry. My mother was just broken hearted. Unfortunately, after a time, Michelle's case started to go cold, and not only that, it was appearing less and less in the media due to no new updates on the case. Her murder still hung over the community like a dark cloud and haunted Cedar Rapids, particularly because it was unsolved, meaning the killer was still at large. But Michelle was no longer front page news, other than on the yearly anniversary of her death. It shook the community to its core and every year on December 19th, people were reminded of Michelle's brutal murder and that the killer was still out there. But due to the lack of evidence and no real witnesses or leads to follow up on, police sadly began to believe that this case would never be solved. Their only hope was that someone would come forward with vital information, and there was actually a $10,000 reward for doing so, but nobody came forward. Sadly, both of Michelle's parents passed away not knowing who had killed their daughter. Albert in 1995 and Janet in 1998, but they both went to the grave strongly believing that Andy Seidel had been their daughter's murderer. In 2006, her case was opened back up and looked at with fresh eyes by a detective named Doug Larison. Doug had actually gone to high school with Michelle, and although he hadn't really known her well and they hadn't been close, the murder had always stuck with him and deeply affected him. He said, quote, I felt a responsibility towards my classmates to actually to get this case solved. By this point, forensic technology had advanced, and knowing this, Doug wanted to take another look at the case and to see if he could get any closer to solving it, saying, quote, Technology changes. Science changes. So I wanted to proceed and move the case forward. It was while reading Michelle's case file that Detective Larison discovered that a previous detective had collected blood scrapings of the gear shift of Michelle's car and these had been sent off for testing. This of course had been forensic technician Richard White, as I mentioned earlier, but nobody had followed up on the test results. Detective Larison got the results back and discovered that there was DNA present on the gear shift, and not only that, but it was determined that it was male DNA. However, it was only a partial DNA profile, so after this, after this discovery, Detective Larison then sent off Michelle's dress, which had been safely stored in evidence. And when he sent this out for testing, a spot of blood on the dress revealed a full DNA sample that matched the DNA found on the gear shift. This was obviously a huge break in the case. Detectives were sure that this DNA was of Michelle's killer. They had long believed that Michelle's killer had most likely cut himself and left blood at the scene, and they were now on a mission to find out whose DNA it was. Detective Larison entered the DNA evidence into the Combined DNA Index System, otherwise known as CODIS, which is a nationwide database of DNA that has been collected from arrested offenders. So if you're familiar with true crime, you've probably heard of CODIS before, and essentially anyone who is arrested for a crime has to submit a DNA sample which is then stored in this database. 
If Michelle's killer had a previous criminal record of any kind, then it could be matched to the DNA found at the crime scene. But unfortunately, there was no match in CODIS. This was a huge disappointment, but Detective Larison knew that the next step was to collect DNA samples from all the people that they had previously suspected or interviewed during the initial investigation. Detective Larison said that they collected DNA from over 100 people, but of course the person at the top of their list was Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel. When police contacted Andy and asked him for his DNA, he willingly obliged and, on testing the DNA, it was discovered that Andy Seidel was not a match. At long last, years and years, decades in fact, after Michelle's murder, he was finally cleared of the crime once and for all and fully eliminated as a suspect in Michelle's case. But the damage had been done to Andy's life. Not only did he lose the person he loved as a teenager in a horrific manner which would have caused extreme trauma in itself, but he had spent 27 years of his life being suspected and accused of the brutal murder. He was the main suspect not only of police officers, but also everyone in his hometown of Cedar Rapids, to the point where he felt the need to leave. I mean, Michelle's own parents were certain that he had been the killer, and it's such a shame that they died thinking that. When it was revealed that Andy's DNA had not been a match, and that he was ruled out once and for all, Michelle's family were absolutely stunned. Janelle and her husband, John Stonebreaker, later said that they wished they could tell Andy they were sorry, and that they felt terrible that he had become a victim in Michelle's murder as well. But at this point, Andy had kind of cut contact with the family and just wanted to leave Cedar Rapids behind, which he had tried to do a long time ago when he left for the Navy. He had since gotten married and started a new life far away from Cedar Rapids and his past, and I'm sure that finally being cleared of the crime was freeing, but still would have brought up all the painful memories. Another of the men that detectives approached for DNA was Curtis Thomas, who, if you remember, was the boy who had spent his work break with Michelle the night of her murder and then walked her to the mall exit. Unlike Andy, Curtis wasn't so forthright with his DNA, instead refusing to, co to cooperate and give it to police. This immediately raised a red flag with police and they began to think that they might have their guy, simply due to Curtis refusing to offer up his DNA. But Curtis said that he declined to give his DNA to police because he already had a strong distrust for them, which had developed in the initial investigation of Michelle's murder when he had been interrogated by them. Like I mentioned earlier, police questioned anyone that they thought could be a suspect, but Curtis felt particularly attacked by the police. He was harshly grilled by them, despite the fact that he had a strong alibi, since he had gone back to work after leaving Michelle and had not only been seen by his manager, but also by Cheryl, the girl who had been smoking a cigarette. But Curtis said that it felt as though they were trying to force a confession from him regardless, and this was very upsetting, especially as a 16-year-old boy who had just lost a friend to murder and not only knew he had nothing to do with it, but was already dealing with the stress and the burden of the guilt for not walking Michelle to her car that night. So when police approached him 27 years later, he was immediately distrustful and thought that, much like when he was a teenager, they were potentially trying to pin the murder on him again. When detectives rang Curtis to request his DNA, he told them that he would not give a sample, and while still on the phone, Curtis claims that the detective on the line yelled out to his co-workers that they'd found their guy, kind of as a reverse psychology tactic, so that Curtis would give in and agree to give a DNA sample. The police at this point just wanted to rule Curtis out, but Curtis believed he had already been ruled out, both by witnesses and by the record of him punching out at work. He didn't think that detectives should be focusing on him at all. 
but eventually Curtis Thomas and his lawyer did sit down with the police and obviously this time the experience wasn't like it had been when police had essentially interrogated Curtis when he was a teenager, so he did end up agreeing to give a DNA sample. And just like Andy's, Curtis Thomas's DNA did not match the sample found at the crime scene. So at this point, the DNA had not matched anyone in CODIS, nor had it matched any of the over 100 samples that had been taken from any of the men that Michelle may have known or had had a connection to at the time of her death. So unfortunately, the case was essentially still cold, despite Detective Larison's progress that he'd made while being the lead on the case, which had spanned over a decade. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it for part one of this video. Like I said, part two will be out very shortly in just a few days. And I highly recommend watching that because it gets absolutely fascinating how they end up catching the killer. So you don't want to miss it. Please remember to like this video if you did like the video and comment down below what cases you'd like to see me do in future. I have a few up my sleeve, but... I'd love to hear what you guys would actually like to see. And please just remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I hope to see you in part two of the case. Bye-bye.